Is that better? Okay, hello everybody. Um, my name is Matthew Shears, um, and uh, along with Henri and Mallory, Mallory's who's handing out the, uh, the papers there, and Henri who is sitting here opposite me, um, we've uh, organized this session to kick off a discussion around cyber harms and their impact on human rights. Um, this is entirely informal, as you will have noted from the discussion, so um, from the description. So what we're hoping is that we can have a very interactive discussion about cyber harms and human rights with uh, a possible looking forward to the next IGF or possibly even RightsCon where we might be able to take this discussion further into perhaps a more formal workshop panel uh, structure. So what I've, what's being dis distributed here is a brief, it's a summary of the um, description that was on the uh, website, but also some suggested items for our agenda. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of background where, why we've initiated this and where we're coming from in a minute. Um, but we've got about an hour and a half. I don't think we'll need that amount of time, but if we do, that's a marvelous indicator of a robust discussion. So we can go to an hour and a half if we need to. Um, and um, I had anticipated that this wasn't, we weren't going to have any um, projection or uh, transcription or things like that, but it seems we do, so that'll be helpful. So anyway, just bear in mind, if you are going to say something, it's not as informal as we had perhaps early, uh, uh, anticipated from the beginning. Um, okay, so a little bit of background. Um, some time ago, starting back in um, 2013, 2014, um, I and a number of us who are here were members of the Freedom Online Coalition's Working Group 1 on an Internet Free and Secure. And that working group developed over a period of three to four years, three years, a set of recommendations on cybersecurity and human rights and also a definition of cybersecurity and human rights. Um, the Freedom Online Coalition, those working groups of which were three, though their mandate under the Freedom Online Coalition has ended, but we, those of us who were working on the uh, Human Rights and Cybersecurity Initiative thought that the work was important enough and substantive enough that we should continue it in, uh, beyond the, um, the Freedom Online Coalition. So a number of us are doing that. And what, we, what we've decided is that we have a, and there are a couple of reasons why we're looking at cyber harms. But one of the key elements of the definition and the recommendation that we developed, which is here, so we can hand those around as well. One of the key um, and defining elements of those recommendations and that definition of cybersecurity was that we've probably for the first time when it came to defining cybersecurity, we talked about the individual. The, we talked about the person. And we talked about, and we talked very much in the recommendations on human rights, not as a balancing act of cybersecurity, but as something that's mutually reinforcing. So when we came to, so it was this focus on the person and how do we continue the work of the working group that made us think about, well, maybe there is a dimension here that we need to consider, which is, what are, in order to measure how one can implement these recommendations, one has to understand what the implications of cybersecurity are for the person and their rights, which led us to starting this initiative, which is really in this initial discussion, which is how do we assess what the cyber harms are to the person, and how do we understand how we can minimize or mitigate what those harms are, and through what kind of measures. And so what you're receiving now is the definition from that working group and, the, and, um, and some of the recommendations. And that work can be found on, the, um, on our website, which is freeandsecure.online, where you'll find all this work. Now, the reason why this work is important and it's, it's, it's useful to those of us who are interested in cyber harms is that the work, the recommendations and the definition have global support. They are supported by the governments of the Freedom Online Coalition. At the time, I believe, if I remember correctly, it was about 27 governments. And they're supported by private sector, um, civil society, and other organizations. And you can find all that on the website. So the challenge is really, so that's a brief history of, the, of that. So the working group is continuing in a very ad hoc format, and there are a number of us who are involved in that. 
and we would love for others to join us in the effort of taking these recommendations and definition forward. So that's a, a brief context, if you will, to this discussion, which is if we are really to talk about cybersecurity and human rights and, its, and cybersecurity and its impact on the person, how do we assess that? How do we measure that? And, and how do we work to minimizing those impacts on the person? And that's really what this discussion is about. So it's talking about cyber harms. We're not talking about cyber harms in terms of how they impact an organization or a structure or an infrastructure. We're talking about what we really want to focus in on here is how do we assess what those cyber harms are and in terms of their impact on persons and their human rights. So does that make sense to everybody? Does everybody understand the kind of the general framing? And you'll see from the, if you, want to, if you go on the website, you'll see the recommendations and the background and the history and um, you'll see some of that on that piece of paper. So we have a number of people who are going to jump in here and there, I'm hoping, in this discussion, but I thought it was probably useful for me just to kind of walk very top level, and others will help me out here, um, what is generally meant by cyber harms and how we're, we're looking at a slightly differenti a differentiated um, approach, if, you'll, if you can call it that. So, so the, the um, and I'm, I, I've, I'm not with the University of Oxford nor with the Said Business School, so I'm going to, I probably won't do justice to the work that they've done on cyber harms and, and others can jump in here and perhaps dis describe uh, some of it as well. But um, perhaps the, the, the first piece of work that really came out on cyber harms that was a, a, f a real research paper that went into it was in 2016 from the Oxford Said Business School. And it, it looked at cyber harms more broadly. And I'm just going to read a couple of things from there just so that we, we're all kind of on the same page. But, and I apologize, apologize if I'm reading off my laptop, but th that research paper defines cyber harm as the following. Cyber harm is generally understood as the damaging consequences re resulting from cyber events which can originate from malicious, accidental, or nat and natural phenomena manifesting itself within or outside of the internet. And those damaging consequences need not be limited to ICT. Physical or emotional harm, both material and personal, can also be envisaged. In other words, where cyber harm is concerned, the spectra of cause and consequence are unusually wide. Now, the one interesting thing about this particular definition, and I think these have evolved over time, is there is no particular focus or reference to, the human, to human rights. Let's talk about what the... the, the the harm might be to the individual from a physical sense, but it doesn't go that extra step. Um, and, and so let me just keep going here and, and then we can come back to our discussion. So the, the way that this paper measures cyber harm um, is it talks about a couple of approaches. It says we have to measure it according to the following. Who and what can be harmed, the different types of harm, stakeholders and their different priorities and perceptions of harm, potential measurements of harm and the categories, and then who is responsible for acting on those different forms of harm. So there's a, there's a whole um, analysis method that Oxford uses to go into this, which is, which is quite useful. Um, and it talks about things like physical, psychological, economic, reputational, cultural, and political harm, and it impacts the individual, the organization, property infrastructure, etc. So those are the kind of things that have been used traditionally, I would say, to deal with cyber harms. Now, the one thing that what, what, we have, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to say, okay, that's fine when you're looking at an organization or you're looking at, and you're looking at cyber harms as they come from an outside entity or a cyber threat. But there are multiple dimensions to cyber security that impact human rights. So you have an external cyber attack threat that can impact human rights. You have a response to that that can impact human rights. And then you may also have policies that, develop, that are developed nationally that may impact human rights because they're disproportionate, et cetera. So what we want to do is try and have a discussion here about how we can, we can, in, in, we can develop that, sense, that understanding of what they are and how we can measure them. And then we have a much better capability of saying to states, well, these are the set of harms that come from these kind of actions. What, these are the measures that we need to take to mitigate or minimize those actions so we're not impacting human rights. So th that's the kind of outline that, that Oxford has used, and, and Ian, feel free to jump in, or David, or whoever. Um, 
that there's been further work by Oxford where um, uh, articles have been written on how these cyber harms can also be derived, can also occur through surveillance and excessive law enforcement activities and things like that. So you, you can find these, these online. So the issue really for this discussion is um, how do we leverage what's already been done in terms of cyber harm and how do we bring a, a, a human rights focus to that work? And so this is, an, you know, this is the way that we've framed this for this discussion. But obviously, we'd love to hear if there are other perspectives on how we might frame this and take this forward and what issues might be first front of mind so that the goal really is to come out of this, this workshop, informal workshop, with a sense of a direction so that the work could continue and then we could continue to, to take this forward in some form um, with your help. Um, leveraging the work that you've seen from the Working Group 1 of the Freedom Online Coalition and the work that's been done by others like Oxford and take this work into a, this, this, take this forward into a workshop perhaps at the IGF or elsewhere and, um, and then have a fuller discussion. So, shall I leave it there? David, Ian, Henri or Mallory, I'm going to turn to you first if you want to add or, or um, I think I've spoken long enough. Um, all, you have to introduce yourself. Sorry, I'm um, Ian Brown. I'm, um, I'm not here speaking on behalf of the UK government. I, I'm currently principal scientist for one of the government departments, but I'm not working on this, this policy area. But just very briefly to, to mention what the UK government is doing that's, that's relevant to this work, which is all public. Um, the, the current government, the Conservative government, which was elected in 2017, uh, had a manifesto commitment to make the UK the safest place in the world to be online. And that's something that has been a, a very um, high political priority for the government, with the Prime Minister and several ministers giving regular uh, speeches on the matter. Um, what President Macron said yesterday, actually our Prime Minister has said, has said a number of times previously, um, including uh, last, last summer, she, she declared enough is enough when it came to online harm and promised to work with allied democratic governments to reach international agreements that regulate cyberspace and do everything we can at home to prevent the spread of extremism online. So that extremism has been a quite long running focus of the UK government. Um, radicalization to violent extremism to, to sort of give it, give it its full title. Um, our Home Office, which is um, responsible for policing and, and criminal justice and so on, has an extensive um, program called Prevent, which is about, you know, it's interesting how the language is used in different ways by different people. So it, this program talks about individuals who are vulnerable to extremism and radicalization. So um, it, teenagers, often from specific communities in the UK, uh, the government has had concerns about certain materials that um, are being accessed online, which of course then leads to calls for schools and for internet cafes to um, block access to certain, uh, certain websites. Um, but alongside that long-running concern, we've also had, um, uh, particularly the last two or three years, I think, um, a real focus are from the UK government on, on protecting children, on child welfare, um, including exposure to internet pornography, um, to, uh, to cyberbullying and to harassment. Um, and if you look at the, um, the consultation paper on the government's internet safety strategy, which was published last year, um, as well as those areas, it also covers um, the F word, fake, fake news, disinformation. The UK government's now also banned the term fake news, you'll be ple pleased to hear. Um, online misogyny and trolling. Because actually, um, a lot, um, a number of female members of parliament in the UK, amongst other high um, public figures, have uh, suffered a lot of abuse online and found it very concerning. You know, even to the level of receiving death threats and having, and then physical violence cause, um, happening at the same time, and having to get police protection. So that that is something also that the um, the, the UK government has been focusing on. Just a couple of final points. Um, I think the UK government is very keen to see a lot more research and evidence in this area. Um, it's great that this work is going on and I think it could be developed a lot, a lot further. Um, and lastly, we've seen um, some institutions in the UK that have not previously been involved in these kind of debates um, publish research. For example, our Children's Commissioner for England and Wales published a report just a couple of weeks ago looking at children's online privacy and vulnerability. 
as a consequence of sharing data about themselves um, online. And of course, things like uh, as cyber physical systems, systems become much more prevalent, including toys, um, that's something that, it, that often now is big, becomes big um, media issues in the UK, that are, you know, a, a doll that's spying on, spying on children or that uh, is not adequately secured, enable, enabling other people to hack into a toy and then spy, spy on families. So I think there's, a lot, there's some interesting scope there as well. It's, you know, it's not only the, the human rights traditional agencies and defenders, um, it's uh, some countries, including the UK, have institutions to protect other uh, vulnerable groups, um, particularly children, it would be great to involve them, I think. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. That's, that's very helpful. Um, Mallory, do you, maybe do you want to jump in and just kind of give a perspective on, well, I've, I've talked a little bit about the Freedom Online Coalition Working Group, but I don't know if you want to add anything more on that or on this or, or comment. Well, yeah, I mean, I think the way that this came up is we were trying to think about what could we talk about that would be most impactful, what could we do? Because we actually had pretty limited capacity at this point to continue, um, you know, progressing our work. Um, and this came up because, and I think it actually ties into the main session earlier today, people were there, which is that there is no shortage of, like, FUD, of fear, uncertainty, and doubt, like, coming from the governments. Like, that's, it's not something that we need to make evidence around. I think what is necessary is to ground that evidence in human rights abuses as one like specific frame for, for like what is wrong and what's going wrong and what are the potential harms. Um, but then also just being able to be concrete and specific about what is happening rather than having the conversation way high high level about like this is bad, you know, cybersecurity is important. But then we, we, we have we have some, some more concrete evidence. So I think it serves those those two purposes. Like you know, specific har evidence of harm grounded in human rights changes the conversation um, and, it, and it kind of gets it out of that space of like, well, let's just securitize everything and, and take over all the things. So that's why I think it would be, and, and really, like your, Matthew is right, the, this meeting is really to just scope the issues, to hear from experts in the room um, about this because, yeah, it's meant to be a discussion. So <coughs> I definitely want to stop talking now. <laughs> Henri or David? I am yanked into the room at the last minute by Matthew. Um, um, firstly, uh, I think uh, there's a difference between Oxford University and the Sony Business School, um, uh, which is worth bearing in mind. So this is, uh, Oxford University doesn't have a position on, uh, on this. The Sony Business School has produced some work on it. Um, I, uh, so this is just some thoughts I just scratched down, which in an attempt to be controversial, probably. Um, so I can remember back at the time of, of the World Summit in 2003, um, uh, trying to argue that uh, um, the internet um, and digitalization in general uh, was not an inherent good, as most people at the World Summit thought. Um, it was something that was going to have transformative impacts, and those impacts would be um, both good and bad. They would be used by people who wanted to let's say, improve society and those who wanted to harm society, those who wanted to use them for their own purposes, um, which were potentially malevolent, um, and that it was, a, it was a mistake to see to see it as something other than a transformational change, to try and see it as something that was an inherent positive. We needed to deal with those uh, potential negatives. Um, and, and I think, thirdly, that most of the consequences will be unexpected. Um, so I think in practice, uh, um, you know, I kind of feel a bit vindicated really about that, uh, but that was not a popular view at the time, I have to say, of the World Summit. Um, and I think there ha that a lot of the problems that we have now have stemmed from a failure to address the fact that something that people wanted to think was inherently good also had these really rather substantial downsides which were going to have negative economic, social, cultural, political consequences. Uh, so we haven't done enough thinking about it and that's why we need now to, to have a much more serious understanding of what is harmful and what is wh where risk lies and so forth. And I probably reiterate, I think, an enabling technology is going to be used by everybody to enable what they want to do. Uh, well, in practice, criminals are rather good at using enabling technologies and always have been. Um, so are authoritarian governments, so are exploitative businesses. Um, and um, uh, so, so I would say that, that actually, I'm uh, pointing that, and, and in one sense, I think, I try to think what, who was it that said this the other day? Um, ben Cerf actually gave a, uh, a, a very, uh, an outstanding lecture, I think, last week in Oxford, as it happens, in which he was addressing these issues. 
was it him that said that this is also, uh, no, it probably wasn't actually him, I think it was somebody else, so let, me, let me set that aside, but, um, but he was emphasizing these downsides in that particular speech. Um, and one of the things I think we, we have here is, yes, it is an enabling, the most enabling means of, inf of, uh, of disseminating information we've ever had, it's also um, uh, the most um, effective means of manipulating information we've ever had. Uh, and you have to put those two things together. So uh, the, one, the, the one final thing I'd say is that I'm not convinced that locating this as a human rights discussion is the right place to locate it. I think it is significantly wider than that. Um, and I draw attention to, I think, to ways in which human rights uh, are being understood within many societies as a concept. Um, and in particular to, to the way, in, to the kind of thinking around this that Michael Ignatieff uh, came, uh, uh, published last year in which he was talking about a need to reframe rights language or that rights language had lost its resonance for many people and that in order to regain resonance it needed to be reframed in a, in a different or broader ethical values laden framework. Um, so I think simply saying it's in the rights, it's in the international rights regime and therefore no longer works for many stakeholders, governments, businesses, civil society stakeholders, but particularly ordinary people. Thank you. Ari, want to jump in? Well, I think David has, has covered a lot of what we were planning to say from, um, from Research ICT Africa. Um, the bigger concern being that there's, at, um, you know, all of these conferences and, and even this week, there's this em emphasis on um, promoting digital inclusion at all costs. They don't even call it inclusion, they call it access and, and that sort of thing, without looking at the potential harm that, come, that comes from that. And I think, and this is also why I'm excited to see Jack in the room, who does a lot of work on online abuse and that sort of thing. And I think a part, a part of that problem is that we don't understand harm well enough yet. And um, I think I have more questions than answers in the sense that do we, do we need to differentiate different forms of harm that we need to look at different communities and I think tied to what David was saying around language is I'm sure harm will be understood in very different ways in different communities as rights are um, and some things will be considered bad in some communities if not in others um, so I think again we have more questions than answers at this point but it is important to have a more nuanced understanding especially as we promote you know the need to um, connect everyone at the moment. She's teed you up, Jack. Do you want, do you want to say a couple of words? I can. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks for this, and also thanks for um, alerting me to this meeting, Andrea, as well. Um, I think this is really interesting. So I'm from APC, Association for Progressive Communications. Um, we have been working on the issue of online gender-based violence since 2005 and have been doing really sort of on-the-ground research on how this is being expressed, what are the adequacy of um, legislative response as well as by um, internet platforms since 2008, primarily focusing in the global south and trying to exactly sort of pinpoint this issue of what is the harm, um, what are the responses, what is the sort of um, research that needs to be done, how do we even define online gender-based violence when there's a whole bunch of different kinds of acts that are involved and even though David thinks that rights is no longer um, resonating, I think for many groups of people, rights is still really important to even just say that this impacts on a particular um, area of rights. So for example, you know, right to freedom of gender or sexual expression. Uh, and if, I mean, if I may, maybe I can share some of the things that we have um, uncovered in relation to this. So when you were speaking about the different types of harm, for example, um, we mapped specific cases in the period of two years and we had like sort of something like 1,124 um, cases mapped and the kinds of harm that we looked at was psychological harm, social isolation, economic loss, limited mobility, self-censorship and I think also looking at online gender-based violence as a specific barrier to access has been an important piece of work in relation to that. And then we also tried to unpack who is affected, which was one of the questions you raised earlier, um, specifically someone involved in an intimate relationship, 
professionals often involved in the public, so things like MPs and so forth that was being spoken about, but also, you know, um, cult, well, celebrities, um, so to speak, um, and existing survivors of, um, of, um, of physical assault or those who are existing in situations of gender-based violence. So it's kind of like a continuum. And this work has been really important to also engage with um, sort of global norms around gender-based violence to also expand and take into consideration the cyber or the internet digital dimension of this. And last year, there's been quite a lot of um, recognition of this work in various processes. So from um, Special Repertoire on Violence Against Women, HRC Resolution on Gender-Based Violence, um, to the CEDAW General Recommendation 35 that is a treaty body that has specific mechanisms of monitoring and trying to make sure that there is state accountability on this issue. But I do see that there is a disconnect between the conversations on cybersecurity and the conversations on online gender-based violence. It's as if it's two different things. Um, so this is exciting because it's really trying to also locate where the harm is happening um, to specific bodies and to specific people who are in specific contexts. And that's quite critical then to see that there is an existing body of work um, that, is, that has happened, um, that, the, that the research last year um, sort of can speak to the existing body of work as well and to see how this can both build on each other to gather a deeper understanding um, and that how these two bodies of work that are doing, I mean, yeah, different networks of work that's trying to, I guess, come up with a response um, can benefit from more of these bridging conversations. That's, that's very useful, thank you. And, and also quite exciting because it's, as you say, it's a, it's a body of work that already exists. It's identified some of these key harms. <coughs> that's really good. Um, so. We did say this was going to be an informal discussion. Um, I would welcome anybody taking the mic, as long as you introduce who you are and, and, um, and don't feel shy. This is really going to hopefully shape something that we're going to take forward. So I, thoughts about what kind of harms that, that individuals, how do they impact human rights? Um, have, has anyone in the room done any work like APC has done? What, what um, please feel free to, to yes, please. Hi, my name is Catherine Tai. I work for SIFE. Um, I've not done like something on the gender-based um, discrimination or gender-based violence, but um, I just want to quickly share some observations that I have had the past two days or one and a half days. So this is my first time to IGF, so I don't know if this is our accurate uh, description of some things. Um, so uh, first thing is uh, uh, yesterday a lot of sessions talk about multi-stakeholder approach to talk about internet governance, but then I just feel that um, one question is being missing, and the question is in some authoritarian countries there's no civil society. So basically the space <coughs> for civil societies are being, you know, crashed, limited, so they're not even in the discussion. So, um, so then I feel like Sure, everyone understands multi-stakeholder approach is important, but when we're dealing with you know authoritarian regimes, so yesterday in the panel, people single out, um, I think Russia, China, and some, yeah. But yeah, what do we do with them, <laughs> right? So China being an extreme case. Um, and then the second question I have is, um, I agree with uh, uh, you that you know ICT is not necessarily good, and so we have to think about, you know, when they're being adopted and used uh, in different scenarios. So again, you know, uh, this morning there's a session about smart city. So I think, you know, people realize and it's pretty fully recognized that, you know, if it's being used correctly, you know, you consider inclusion, you consider, you know, um, you know, other things that under democratic government this could be, you know, bring a lot of uh, benefits so then you make the governance, you make the public service delivery more efficient and more effective. But then again, you know, you also have uh, authoritarian governments trying to uh, promote these kind of model how to tighter control the society. And it's not just in their own countries, but also they're trying to promote this as a model in other countries. So we're talking about international impact, right? So there, there are a lot of countries in the middle. Then what about them? You know, what are the norms that we can help to set out and to help, I don't know, guide or, you know, prevent some intended um, negative consequences from happening? 
um, like we see in extreme cases that are already happening. Um, and then the third is yesterday, uh, President Macron um, talked about, you know, there are two um, sectors that he, or two actors that he thinks should be regulated. One is uh, Silicon Valley tech giant, and the second is China. And then, so my question is, how about um, tech giants in China, right? So when they are going to, um, uh, when they're going to say, you know, neighboring countries, um, you know, like say Southeast Asia or like doing Alipay or, you know, they're basically constructing a lot of infrastructure in even advanced and modern countries, then what happened to the data? I have no idea, right? So I don't know if these are the, the questions that we should ask, but these definitely are the questions that I have. Welcome to, welcome to the IGF. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> These are exactly the kind of questions that we, we, we tussle with, but um, I think I, some of those I think are a little bit beyond the scope of what we were trying to discuss here, but I think they're, I think they're the kind of question that you should ask a lot of people and get their feedback on, because this is, tip, this is a great space for getting feedback on some of those questions. The one, the one that I think that, I'll, let me just touch on the second one, which was, the use of ICTs in, in, I think, what you call different scenarios and, and coming back to David's point, which was, you know, this is an enabler and an enabler can be used in different ways, which I think is, is absolutely right. Um, and I can only go back to the document that we circulated, which was this list of recommendations. That, you, you asked about norms. I mean, there's a lot of norms floating around at the moment. Um, I think we, del in this working group, we deliberately didn't call them norms. We called them recommendations. Um, and I probably should say that the working group that developed these was a multi-stakeholder working group and had the US, um, Canada, and the Netherlands in the working group as well. So these recommendations come with significant um, government support. But what's interesting about these, I think, is it does, act it does say that when you're, it implies that when you are developing ICTs or different kinds of technologies or whether you're developing security policies or whatever it might be, that one does really need to look at these in terms of the impact that they could have on human rights. And we talk specifically in here about cybersecurity policies and decision making being rights respecting by design. So there's a, there's a very clear call for when governments in particular, in the case of these recommendations, are considering policies or considering, for that matter, responses to other cyber threats or things like that, that they should do so with human rights first and foremost in mind, rather than it being something of secondary or tertiary um, importance. So that's it's a partial answer to, you know, how do you take the discussion forward? I think part of the, 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 the suggestion that we're making here is that you take that discussion forward with a, a human rights from the outset approach in mind. And that's very challenging. Granted, it's very you know it's very challenging to achieve, but it's a it's a recommendation that we can we have significant support for and have the backing to be able to take that further. So a partial answer. I don't know if anybody else wants to answer any of your other questions, but I'll leave it at that. Anyone else? Please jump in. So, uh, you, sorry, use the mic and introduce sorry, yourself, please. Sorry, my name is Carrie Ann. I'm from IGO. I can't answer your questions, but I did have a question for them. Um, I could probably talk to you off air about some of the questions you had. Um, I just wanted to see, just listening to um, the discussion, I didn't get the name of, um, I, I can't remember, just, just taking in the issues that you raised in terms of acknowledging that based on the research here, it would feed into your work in identifying that you are like a subset of different types of harm based on different profiles. Is there an assumption, because we're tying it with human rights, that harm is automatically a violation of human rights? Because you, you've, you've, the conversation you had just now kind of steered it towards governments and the rights that governments should have to ensure that human rights are sustained. But harm in terms of being conducted otherwise, would it be perceived harm? I perceive that you are harmed online as opposed to your asserting harm because you actually did feel harm online, using your example. Because I could assume that, for example, I'm from the Caribbean and persons would say, oh, women's rights, women's rights from the Caribbean is not as much an issue as when I speak to my colleagues in Latin America, where in the Caribbean women are more assertive. In Latin America, they're less assertive in terms of how the structures are with the, the male gender 
issues. So I'm just wondering, have you considered, because in tying it so directly with human rights, as I said, it, it trumps it up to government automatically, but some of the harm issues we're speaking about is people-to-people -people harm and the responsibility of state to kind of work with private sector to help to stem that harm. So I'm, I'm kind of lost in the discussion only because I'm hearing like seven different concepts that's trying to merge together, but I'm not seeing this, the thread that's sewing them together very seamlessly. So when it goes out to persons like me, you have to consume it to make sure that I catch those, because it's a strong message, but it's just, I just, it's a lot of, it's like when, I think when, when you had described it, I got it because you actually tied it back to the discussion on this side. Mm -hmm. But I think those, some of the lead in the dialogue, it's straying it away from harm automatically being a presumption and it's a human right, mm -hmm. when it's not an automatic presumption. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying if someone could sew it together a little bit, maybe you, for me, that's why I can't participate in the dialogue because I'm a bit lost with the thread. Well, I think first of all, human rights is not just the obligation of states. I think companies also have to stand by um, principles of human rights and there has been a lot of different kinds of, um, I guess, mechanisms um, in order to do that. And I think human rights is also, hu is also a person-to-person -person issue. So I think that's one thing to say. And secondly is that whether harm automatically becomes a violation of rights, I'm thinking in my brain and I'm like, well, I don't know if it's violation, but generally it will definitely involve some kind of right because we're talking about civil and political rights, but we're also talking about economic, social and cultural rights. So having a rights framework is very useful, even though a little bit passe and maybe oversaturated and we are like, oh my God, no more rights. Um, it's still a really important and useful framework because it's the only one we have where we all kind of more or less agree and say, yeah, these things matter, and we've developed all kinds of different mechanisms and systems to understand how this affects different populations, um, and how do we then ensure we go about um, looking at it. And I think, so in some ways, you're almost looking like a nested conversation. No? You have cybersecurity as a framework, and then you're trying to look at specific sorts of cyber harms. And within that, we're also trying to look at making sure that online gender-based violence is recognized as this as a bunch of specific forms of cyber harms where a lot of work has been done and also gains have been made at both national, local, as well as international levels of norm setting um, to that extent. So it's almost like trying to see it from that level. And whichever your entry point that makes most sense to you where you sit, then you come in that way. Yeah, <laughs> discussion, how you framed it, and I mean it's script, thank God the transcript is there. I think that helps the introduction to the dialogue. Right. Because the questions, I look at them and all I see is cyber security questions with human rights being slapped on. Because I'm a cyber security right. professional. But it just seemed that somebody just slapped on human rights everywhere. <laughs> and to me, that's not what you're saying. I heard something different. And I think how you described it, the nested approach, I think that would help the framework to read these questions in a different lens. That's just my recommendation to you. Yeah. It's a great recommendation. And, and by the way, that's exactly the purpose of this discussion. To, to, to thread that needle or however you want to characterize it. Um, the recommendations that you see um, are not specific to government. They were developed by a multi-stakeholder group. They were specifically designed to be applicable. We talk about processes as well, so that could very well apply to a private sector initiative or other initiatives, so it's not specific to government. Um, but I, I absolutely agree with you. But then that's, that's really the purpose of this, is actually to try and figure out how do we, how do we tie these things together. Um, and, and I think you, Jack, thank you. That was a, a very nicely, nice way of putting the, the nesting concept. Um, anybody else? Thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Luke Tokunov. I'm a, a human rights diplomat from uh, Luxembourg. And uh, thanks very much for organizing this conversation. Um, I have two things to say. One is the more broad fundamental uh, issues that have been raised about the human rights framework. Uh, and I think the, um, the lady on the right, and I'm, I'm sorry I don't know most people in here, um, has said it very well. Human rights are a very broad, a very complex, and also an evolving framework uh, that benefits a lot from innovations uh, that is indivisible in the sense that um, you don't just have civil and political rights, but also economic, social and cultural rights and indeed possibly um, rights beyond that. Um, it is a universally accepted framework by governments around the world, uh, although it is also contested. But 
I would warn that the contestation comes from people uh, usually who don't have a good reason to contest it, uh, but who are either authoritarian governments uh, or greedy corporations or uh, extremist groups, uh, etc. Uh, nobody contests the human rights framework and the protection that it provides to human dignity and equality uh, uh, for a sound reason, uh, other than uh, enrichment or, or criminal activity or repression uh, and so on and so forth. So I think that's, that's very important, and when you say that um, I think, David, that rights no longer resonate today. Um, that has to be, of course, understood uh, in, in, in the right context as well. I'm not sure I, I do, um, but I think it's, uh, um, it's important that we put this in the right framework and that we uh, also take into account the evolution of, of human rights. Uh, a lot of this is not very new at all. Um, if you look at Article 1 of the Universal uh, Declaration on Human Rights, uh, it states that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and in rights. And I think that holds true to this day, and that's uh, whether you're um, uh, the poorest person in Afghanistan or the richest person in Zimbabwe, uh, that, that, is, that is really something that is an, an all-inclusive and, and universal framework. Uh, and then, of course, also the, um, the fact that uh, human rights also live in uh, not only hard law but also soft law. Uh, there are things like the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, uh, which have uh, which list state obligations, uh, but also uh, corporation uh, responsibilities for the protection of human rights. Uh, and it's a good starting point. A lot has been written about it, uh, and it, it's also uh, certainly perfectible. Um, to the questions of, of, of Catherine, um, I think this, this is uh, a, a, a very, very current uh, issue that you raised, and it's this uh, problem that governments export forms of control, uh, I mean authoritarian governments export forms of control uh, elsewhere. Um, and I think when you link it to this uh, discussion here about harm, uh, you could call this a form of uh, export of, of, um, of collective or, or very large-scale harm, because what it is designed to do is to restrict the rights of people elsewhere. And it happens in many different ways. Um, I mean, you have governments that export, that talk to other governments on, uh, in uh, illegal contexts, and they export uh, sets of laws that restrict the rights of citizens, of, uh, of civil society, of women, of, uh, of youth groups, and that also applies in the field of cybersecurity. Um, and that's, that's also closely linked to, to what you talked about when you said uh, that there is a, a spreading of, of negative norms. Um, and it's not just authoritarian governments, uh, uh, it's also uh, Western governments that, that can play uh, along with this because there is a, a fundamental problem that we have uh, even here uh, with a, uh, a false dichotomy that we've built on the one hand between security and the other hand between uh, uh, liberties and, and human rights and we, we keep getting this uh, very, very wrong. Um, and there's a, of, of course also a private sector dimension to this and that's the export of uh, surveillance technology, uh, malware, um, surveillance software and so on and so forth by, uh, by private companies. And there of course the question is uh, should such software be regulated, uh, should it fall under dual use uh, regimes uh, and so on and so forth. I think this, I wasn't here for Mr. Macron's speech yesterday, I think this may be some of the, the things he had in mind uh, as well. And of course the important thing to do is, is to organize um, pushback against all of this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Hi, my name is Roel Raatrink. I work for the city of uh, Amsterdam. Um, and I have a question um, also about the scope of your, of your work. And, and uh, I mean, as a city, we, we do see the negative consequence of digitalization as well. Um, and we have a special concern also for the, the, the role of platforms in, uh, in this process. So I'm wondering if you, when you talk about cybersecurity, uh, I mean, in the Netherlands, when you talk about security, we also talk about things like polarization. You know, we see this as security issues. So I'm wondering if you also took a look at that and the role of algorithms, the role of platforms, and not, not just, you know, proper terrorists, you, but also wider xenophobia, intolerance, etc. I mean, th is that included in your scope? Because we feel the consequences of that in the city, but we do not have the necessary mandate or tools or whatever to, to, to regulate such platforms and such xenophobia, etc. So that's my question. Do you, do you include that in the scope of your work and how? And how do you look at that? 
I don't know. I'm looking at my looking at my fellow working group one ex working group one members. <laughs> um, we I don't um, at the time when we developed these recommendations, we we probably were not looking at that broader scope. We were probably looking at a far narrower scope for cybersecurity. Um, but the the discussion has moved on since then, um, and I think it's probably fair to say that the range of issues now that people typically consider to be cybersecurity is much broader. Um, and so I don't think that's, I think that's something, if, if we as a group or, you know, want to take this work forward, I think that's something that we could, we could look at, yeah. I don't think it's, I think, every, I think this is exactly what it is, a discussion about the opportunity and, and how it could be scoped. Mallory? Yeah, I just wanted to comment because I've actually spoken to people at New York City as well about their, you know, the, the ICT uh, office of the city there, and they also work with uh, several other cities and sort of like a consortium of cities. And I, I think the advice that I've always had is, well, we work in, we, my, my team works on standard setting in, in technical standards bodies. Um, and it's really actually a great thing if, if municipalities feel like they're implementers, because often they are, like you're implementing, you know, wireless networks or you're implementing other things. Um, and, and so following those conversations about, um, you know, standards and, and also these norms and the way that they're applied, I think it, it's, it's similar to maybe less, it's maybe a combination between like a government's role but also a company's role in the way that, you know, business and human rights are, are followed. Um, and so, yeah, I definitely think that there is there's a, a role to play. But um, it's emerging, I think, um, as more cities start to look at, more municipalities anyway start to look at these issues. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, I have a question. Uh, yeah, no, go ahead, David. I'll oh, come back on them now because I'm going to shift us a little bit. Okay. Um, so just just to go back to that, my, the, the point I was making about uh, the resonance of rights language. I mean, what I, I was citing Michael Ignatieff here uh, rather than myself, so I do tend to agree with him. Um, and, and his point is that um, the there is no longer a kind of universal consensus around human rights being a desirable thing in the sense that there was in 1948, let's say, or perhaps even in 1966, in and, and, and public discourse. Uh, but that in many areas of public discourse, it's no longer seen that way. And in my own country in Britain, um, you know, uh, conservative newspapers will use human rights as a term for abuse in, 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 in many cases. The Trump uh, administration does not see human rights in the concept that we would understand them as being a positive thing. Um, uh, white supremacists are arguing, are, are using free speech as a key demand uh, because they're arguing for the right uh, to uh, demand discrimination against parts of the community and indeed to indeed advocate violence. Um, so there is no, so the, the resonance that there was in 1948 has, 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 has been lost and we need to rebuild that and we need to rebuild it by thinking outside the kind of traditional framework. Otherwise we end up citing the rights instruments in the way that um, you might say that ecclesiastical law used to be cited in medieval Europe or um, in, in Old Testament terms a sort of pharisaical way. That that's what it says, therefore it is, we don't need to argue any further about it. So I think that's, that was the point that I was making there. I, the other thing I would suggest is that we tend to think about these, uh, we, uh, I, I'm worried about thinking about these, these things in a binary term, so harm as a binary thing. Uh, so let's take, for example, the employment aspects of, of digitalization. Um, uh, fewer jobs, more efficiently done. Is that harm or not harm? It's harm for some people, it's not harm for other people. Uh, both are actually, I mean, I, I've come down on one side of that particular debate, but both of those are legitimate perspectives. The meaning of harm is not a precise thing, and it's, it's, it's not easy to define either way. What about issues around acceptable levels of harm, <coughs> that notion of acceptable levels of harm? Uh, are there acceptable levels of harm, and what are they? And it, it's just as an example here, I'd cite, um, say, uh, something I've been thinking about recently quite a bit, um, the dissemination of anti-vaccination um, uh, uh, rumors and uh, content uh, on, on the internet, which is having a significant effect in reducing vaccination uh, in some countries uh, to the level where uh, the critical mass is no longer present. So um, from some people's point of view, to restrict that would be uh, an unacceptable um, violation of the rights of free speech, but it's leading to the deaths of children, um, which, let's face it, is surely everybody would agree, a harm. Um, and, and so I think we need to avoid thinking about these things in binary terms and, and, and have a much more nuanced and thoughtful approach to consequences. 
I think it's a great point, David. Um, I wanted to come back to something that Carrie Ann said, actually, if I may, which was the issue of the notion, which you've just touched on, David, which is the issue of differences at the national, differences between countries or differences between cultures in terms of what harm is. And I think this is kind of what you're alluding to as well. And, and I was wondering if anybody else had any thoughts on that as to how, one, how harm is interpreted or understood in different parts of the world. If there are examples of that, that would be very useful. Feel free, jump in. Yeah. So coming from Pakistan, I think criticism of religion is considered as one of the harms that is prevalent in uh, cyberspace. And in Pakistan, we are having these discussions where um, the judiciary and the government have been demanding laws that would criminalize um, criticism of religion as well. So we do have a blasphemy law, but it is being applied in the online space as well. And uh, just uh, this year, we had this case where a person was accused, uh, well, he was sentenced to death for committing blasphemy online as well. So, um, you know, religious, uh, the criticism of religion uh, is considered as a cyber, as, is considered as a harm in our case in Pakistan as well, because religion is a very prime thing uh, in as well. Also, I would also like to share that um, initially, Pakistan also introduced a Cybercrime Act that was meant to take down uh, terrorist content. But we have seen that those anti-terror laws are used to silence dissent. So two weeks ago, um, the owner of a web channel was arrested under anti-terrorism law because he was accused of committing, uh, he was accused of defaming the judiciary. So defamation of judiciary itself is a very subjective term, but again, you know, you, these counter-terror measures are being used to, you know, silence political dissent as well. So the, the measures that were meant to, you know, uh, uh, counter, uh, uh, to counter a bigger issue, uh, they are now being used to, you know, uh, target journalists and human rights defenders as well. So uh, I, th I think uh, in, in our local context, in the global south, cyber harm uh, has its own challenges as well. Um, um, uh, it is being interpreted in, in different ways, and at times it, are, it, is, being, it is being used um, to silence free speech as well. And uh, I'm sorry, do you, do you work, what, what kind of organization do you work I'm, I'm working for Media Matters for Democracy. Uh, it's, it's, an, it's an organization that works at the intersection of media and digital rights. Um, and as part of my work, I'm managing Pakistan's first digital rights news website as well. Thank you. I think, um, actually, I'd like to come back on that. So how do you, so for example, in that case, how do you um, manage the issue that, if you look at it from a kind of a traditional human rights perspective, you might say, well, that's, um, infringing on free expression, for example. Mm -hmm. How do you, and that's a, again, it's a, as David was saying earlier on, it's a very Western construct, and, and, and particularly in this <coughs> cultural sense that you're talking about. But how, how do you as, uh, manage that kind of interesting intersection between the, the law on the one hand and this, this right on the other? To be very honest, uh, human, rights, human rights groups, they are very afraid of touching that topic as well, because, you know, um, we have had instances where um, religious groups have been uh, inciting people for violence, right? So um, the religious groups, uh, they wield immense power, and human rights organizations in Pakistan, they tend to avoid these, to these topics as well. Because, you know, uh, the mere discussion of uh, changing the cyber, the cyber crime law or changing the blasphemy law has got people killed. So a former governor in 2011, um, he was a very powerful person. Uh, he had immense political power as well. But unfortunately, um, he was killed because he was um, um, uh, lobbying and he was advocating for change in, cyber, in, in, in the blasphemy law. Um, so, you know, uh, so people tend to avoid, the human rights organizations tend to avoid these uh, sensitive issues, these red lines as well. And a lot of people tend to uh, exercise self-censorship on religious matters as well. Even not just about religion, um, if you are the one who wants to take a critical assessment of security policies in our context, uh, that will get you in trouble as well. Um, so um, there are a lot of red lines that we have to respect uh, in Pakistan. Um, and, and, and unfortunately, um, we are seeing more self-censorship in cyberspace as well. 
uh, initially it was just in the mainstream media. So in, in Pakistan, initially, um, for, for a very long time, the, the, the human rights defenders and journalists could not find space to do a critical assessment of the security policies. So they used to take to social media and discuss these policies as well. However, uh, things changed drastically in 2017 when four bloggers were picked up, uh, allegedly by the security agencies. And um, their crime was that they were managing Facebook pages that were critically analyzing the human rights violations and the security policies as well. So, you know, you have religion and then you have security issues and then you have these human rights violations that might not be, uh, the, the critical assessment is not welcomed by the uh, deep state as well. So, you know, there, there, are, there are multiple challenges that are at hand. Yeah, challenges is, is uh, yeah, exactly the right word. Yes, please, in the back. Yeah, I just wanted to um, kind of, I think, is it on? Oh, yeah. Uh, so my name is Emil. Uh, I work for the Danish Institute for Human Rights. And we work a lot with uh, well, business and human rights as, as a topic and human rights impact assessments and these kinds of things. And, and I just wanted to say um, I think the discussion is, 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 is great. I don't think we're going to solve what every harm is. Definitely not what is an acceptable harm or not. But uh, if we're talking about private sector actors, I think uh, there is, you know, uh, good arguments to be made that whether some platforms like Facebook, Twitter, or Infra or other uh, platforms um, have not have wanted to have a hands-off approach <coughs> and not kind of we're just providing a platform, we're not actually, um, you know, complicit in any harm that's done on our platforms. They're actively forced to take decisions these days. Facebook just did a human rights impact assessment in Myanmar. They probably didn't want to, but they, they had to in the end. You know, Twitter has pulled off um, people from Twitter in various countries. Um, so they are, in fact, doing this, and they are, in that sense, also co causing harm to, for example, freedom of speech. Um, but, but then to kind of make the plug for human rights, I guess, uh, to say that at least the UN guiding principles for business and human rights that were mentioned they at least provide some sort of framework that is not necessarily perfect, but is a way to interact with harms with, uh, and to not just have a very ad hoc process. You know, if I have a platform where 99% of all the users only insult women or they uh, make death threats to MPs, well, maybe, you know, there is, the balance is not, you know, in my favor here. I need to actually do something about it. Um, I'm not sure where the balance is, but I think it's, you know, we have this framework and I think we should use it until we have something better. Uh, and that can at least de deal with private sector harms uh, in a structured manner. You, ra you raise a great point about what, what frameworks can we leverage to understand harms. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a really good point that we don't, we don't have to, st we, we have the luxury of looking across a number of different initiatives that have been undertaken, including that one. Um, any other, any other comments? Oh, yes, please. Uh, hello, my name's uh, Oliver. I, I'm a human rights lawyer for an organization called Free Expression Myanmar. I just wanted to um, kind of respond a little bit to what my colleague in Pakistan said. So in Myanmar, obviously there's a similar situation to Pakistan in the, in the sense that uh, there are laws or at least legal practices that defend majority religious views. I think the difficulty when it comes to harm is that um, when you have laws, uh, it's very difficult, I mean, from a sort of Western legalistic point of view, it's very difficult to measure the harm within a court. So uh, I'm sure it's the same in Pakistan as in, is in Myanmar, is that if you are... <clears throat> If you are creating some form of harm for a religious group, how do you measure that harm? Because an, obviously a court would normally measure harm in, you know, whether it's uh, in regards to financial uh, issues, they would award compensation. If it was to do with a criminal issue, maybe they would measure the form of violence. But when you're measuring harm against an idea or against a massive group, uh, it's just totally impossible. And then what happens in practice in, in countries like Myanmar and possibly Pakistan, is that the, the decision is just uh, entirely divorced from the, uh, any objective understanding of what is happening. Um, and it tends to, uh, the decision 
just reflects what the political atmosphere is of the day uh, on that particular time. I'm, I don't know if it's the same in, in Pakistan or how, if these cases go to court, how do lawyers make arguments around harm when it comes to religious ideas? I mean, what, what do they measure? What is the objective uh, underlying it? Thanks. <laughs> Hello, my name is Karen Weiss. I'm from the Global Cybersecurity Capacity Center. Um, we published a single paper which was mentioned earlier. Unfortunately, I was a bit late in session. Um, I just want to say like this was, um, it's still a work in progress to develop a cyber harm framework um, based on the interviews um, with experts um, done, I think, um, um, which was uh, input for the existing paper. and. Um, it's something which should help nations later, together with the cyber capacity maturity model that we are deploying, to um, help nations to better understand um, harm and the, understand best, better their assets and where harm could occur. Um, they're currently like that's. I mean, that's all still a work in progress. I'm happy to share um, contact you <laughs> afterward. If someone wants to follow up with also with the researchers who. Um, couldn't be here today, um, but the core, four key themes are assets, controls, harms, and threats, and this came out of the um, of those interviews. Um, um, yeah, I'm happy to to um, speak maybe afterwards about uh, bilateral where the research is, and also see like if there are any kind of um, opportunities to share share some of your work as well. Thank you. Thanks, Caroline. Jack. Did you want to comment? Yeah, sorry. Um, I think I got a little bit lost <laughs> along the way in terms of what, where we're trying to get to in this conversation, but that was very helpful. So I'm like, okay, so development of a framework to understand cyber harm so that you can figure out what we're going to do about it in terms of where we sit is helpful. Did I get that right? Yeah? Okay. Because I got a little bit confused. So the other thing I wanted to also... Um, respond to maybe in relation to two things. One was around insightful speech and where do you measure the harm in that. And I think there's a lot of work that's being done at the moment to try and understand how do you, um, how do you actually identify and measure the harm of insightful speech from various different kinds of uh, standards which probably Mallory can also speak to. Um, and it's not that, I think it's not about harm to ideology, I think it's really about harm to specific groups of people because of the, the sharing of particular kinds of, um, of, of comment. And, and the thing around freedom of expression as well is really also to look at the expression of the most marginal voice, right? It's not to protect the expression of the most majority voices as well, but then I think that the, the exception comes when the minority voices is the one that gets muted a little bit. So I think I, think I just wanted to throw that there. And the other thing to also say um, in terms of some of the work that's being done, because I was trying to figure out, okay, so once you understand the harm, and then what, no? Um, and one thing that we've been looking at in terms of different stakeholder groups is through the online gender-based violence work, is to see how we can apply the principle of due diligence um, to states in terms of looking at harm. So due diligence includes doing things to prevent harm from happening, um, and once harm, so this is through policies or legislation, and once harm has happened to ensure that there is appropriate redress and recourse. So for states, it can be a little bit more straightforward, although juris jurisprudence in online issues will always come in. Um, when it gets a bit trickier is when you're talking about non-state actors. So private corporations, you could still say that you can move from liability to responsibility, that there is a responsibility and there's a ruggy framework, but maybe to actors like technical, um, uh, yeah, people who are more responsible for technical language is leaving me. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, like, you know, for telcos, for example, or to groups like CERT, or to groups like th where you're more involved in the technical aspect of this. That's where it also gets a bit blurry, right? Because you often don't see them as having either rights, duties, or obligations, or responsibility, but more as a service provider. So where, do, where does rights come in, in relation to harm, in relation to role, in this kind of circumstance. Thanks, Can I tell something? Yes. So, mm -hmm. sorry, I interrupted. I am from Georgia. And, uh
can tell you how you how we measure harm. It's physical threat. Uh, because actually Georgia is m one of the most democratic countries in the region, in, uh, in our post-Soviet region, but in spite of the fact uh, Russian, pro-Russian uh, fake news is, and also I can say charge used by some KGB people, are implemented the idea that Western world is, world is uh, bad and uh, also corrupted and uh, it is a bad example for children and etc. And uh, on the Idaho day, uh, the minorities uh, were beaten by church people, also treated and beaten. Uh, normally I really can to say that I'm uh, from the more, one of the most democratic country in the region. So our, uh, uh, we are keen to be democratic, but this uh, media Thanks for that, and sorry that we don't have a mic that can reach to you. Anyone else? Anyone else? And then we'll, we'll, we'll talk about whether or not we can find some steps, some ways forward. Okay. Um, so we've got just a couple of minutes. So this is, <coughs> as we characterize this from the beginning, this was just a kind of an initial discussion. So um, one of the thoughts that we had was that we would try and compile the, the, the comments that have been made, and now we have a transcript, which makes that much easier, and um, think about how we might frame this in the context of the recommendations and the definition and some of the work that's been done, as, I, as you've seen on the paper, and you can go on this, the website on, on um, freeandsecure.online, you can see the, the rest of the work. But if you're interested in, in continuing to be involved in this um, as it evolves, and I, as I said, you know, we're very much at the beginning stages, please let me or Henri or Mallory know, and we'll be sure to keep you in the loop as, as things um, evolve. And what we'll do is we'll do a summary of this, try and give it a bit more context, um, you know, a bit more of a framing, um, and um, if you have any references or documents that you think would be useful to help shape this work, research papers or whatever, that would also be very interesting to, uh, to hear about. Um, and I'll, I'll just, Mallory and then Henri, and then we'll, we'll close it up, I think. Yeah, just a quick comment, because I won't be here tomorrow for the best practice forum on cybersecurity, but usually at the end of the session every year, they sort of discuss possibilities for the intersessional work for the next year. If people find this interesting and want to get engaged in the intersessional work, this could be the topic to do it on. Um, they sort of, the format is they sort of do a scoping thing, everyone can submit to it, and then they come up with a final report. This year it was on cyber norms, but this could be an idea. I know there may be other ideas people have, but if there are people in the room for that session tomorrow that feel strongly about this, this could be one possibility. Um, it doesn't necessarily replace kind of what we want to do, and if you want to work with us on this, we could, and we can do all of the things, because it sounds like there's no shortage of evidence building that's needed on this um, and further exploration. So, yeah, that would be my only, my only comment. No, I think maybe just to add, is, is, it's as you said, it's an exploratory session, but it's good to hear there is work happening. And if anything, it seems like there's need for more collaboration. Um, and if we could at least try and do that, whether it's through a DC or um, this working group, that would be fantastic. Okay. Um, as I said, please come give us your business cards or write down your emails so we can keep you informed. And um, that way we can get out some 
some uh, notes from the session to you if you're interested in continuing to be engaged. Thanks so much, everybody, for turning up. Much appreciated, and thanks for your comments. I think we're, we're finished. <laughs>